And we talk a little bit more about this with Professor Linda Gale Becker, who is a co-lead investigator in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine trial. A very good evening to you, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. So do you agree, for instance, that there are two main factors that could lead to the fourth wave? In your opinion, what are they? Does it correlate with the, what the minister is saying? You know, I think all we have to go on is what's happened in other parts of the world, which seem to lead um, what's happening here. And uh, we have seen, uh, you know, more waves uh, happening to the north. And so I think we have to be prepared that this could happen. The fact that we have not seen a complete elimination of ongoing infection means we remain at risk. So we're seeing grumbling infections going on in a number of provinces. And this means that if, you know, individuals go out and about, as we expect with the festive season coming, that there really is a big risk that we might see a resurgence of infections and takeoff. Um, and then, as the minister was saying this morning, the other sort of concern always is that the, the virus does mutate in a way that develops a variant of concern, changes its transmission pattern, um, and then we may, again, for that reason, see a re resurgence. So there's no doubt that we need to be prepared. Mm. The change of season from the onset of COVID-19 has always been a big factor. So uh, talk to us about any emerging variants. We know that there has been a significant change of season, in, especially in the north. Has there been patterns that we've seen that could come to South Africa? And does the current weather have any mitigating factors for us? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at our first, second and third wave, they did seem to be separated in sort of seasonal ways. I think, though, across the world, vaccination and the coverage of vaccination is having a bit of an impact on, on those waves. So to the north of us, it's been a little bit more of a messy pattern. Um, it hasn't been clearly a, 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 a the spectacular wave that we've seen uh, to date. And so, you know, the question is whether vaccination will have some impact on what those waves look like. But you're absolutely right that like many other uh, aerosol transmitted viral infections, um, there, there often is a seasonality to it. So we do have to think about that as we move into our full summer season. Given what you're saying, then the minister was saying we're looking at uh, perhaps mid-December, late December to the beginning of January, where the expectation initially had been the end of November. So beyond the variant, does the movement, mass movement of people contribute to that, the possibility of the early onset of the fourth wave? Yeah, again, you know, aerosol transmitted infections require a number of key factors. The one is that the, the virus is actually being transmitted. So there's a force of infection. I've already mentioned there is grumbling infection going on. You then need susceptible individuals to be in close contact with someone who could transmit that virus. And again, that increases when individuals are mixing more, when you're having mm -hmm. gatherings and people are more social. And then lastly, you need close contact for that to happen or reason that, you know, people in close proximity. And again, as we have parties and festivity, the chances of people being closer to each other increase. And so those are the main basic ingredients for an outbreak. And that's what we have to try and avoid, if at all possible, or protect ourselves in other ways. And that, of course, is vaccination. How do we better manage manage the movement of people during this festive season as you've mentioned we actually don't know what the figures are from the voting period if there has been a spike so people probably won't even know if they're asymptomatic how do we manage that we a lot of us have not seen our families We're just absolutely uh, pretty much and uh, pardon the phrase dying to be together with as many people as we can so how do we do that how do we manage that and also healthcare workers in the western cape i believe are being given a covid 19 booster shot is that going to help yeah let me answer the first i think one of the ways uh, that in sort of you know for decades now we've known is that preventive vaccines can assist here so 
I my strong feeling here is that we need to really all become ambassadors for vaccination. That if we are going to venues, meeting with people, we might ask whether people have been vaccinated, what the situation is. Let's try and encourage each other to step forward and, and, and be vaccinated. That certainly will provide another level of protection. And then, you know, where possible, it's the summer season where possible, maybe, um, you know, our gatherings can be outdoors in open spaces. And, you know, we can we can try to observe as much as possible the sort of uh, strategies to reduce close contact, particularly with people when we don't know what their vaccination status is or indeed whether or not they are infected. So, you know, I think each uh, family in its own right can can take this on and, and think about it carefully and have those intense conversations. Um, around the Sasanki uh, 2, this really is an important strategy to try to protect our frontline workers. You've already heard ministers concern that we may be down on, on human resources over this period. So we need to make sure that those healthcare workers who are on their feet stay on their feet. And the way to do that is to top up their protection. And so that's what the booster is designed okay. to do. It's just yeah. before I let you go, Prof, there's obviously a great deal of concern in some quarters about the vaccination of children. Tell us about the various vaccine doses that are available and any adverse effect that we have seen, especially from those that have been vaccinated overseas. Is this something we should be concerned about here in South Africa? Well, so what the country has now, uh, you know, uh, uh, allowed is vaccination of 12 and over with the single dose Pfizer. And so this strategy is designed to provide protection for adolescents, um, taking into consideration that they have nice, strong, robust immunity and therefore will respond well to that single dose, but minimizing the risk of side effects. So uh, viewers will be aware that there has been some associated uh, heart muscle uh, effect in very rare cases but nevertheless there with the Pfizer dose this does seem to be time limited it does get better but for this reason I think our regulators and our VMAC has taken the consideration of of, of suggesting a single dose of Pfizer thereby allowing protection but also minimizing risk. All right, thank you so much for speaking to us, Professor Linda Gale Becker is co-lead investigator in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine trial. And according to the figures that I see here, in terms of cases that we have uh, to date, 202 million rather, uh, almost 3 million, 292 million cases with uh, 356 reported infections in the last 24 hours. Deaths we stay at 89,452, 17 deaths have been reported thus far. That's for South Africa's figures.